Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Red Light Report. Um, As always, I hope you guys are doing fantastically. Hope you guys are enjoying sunshine more than I am up here in Montana. We're hitting, <laughs> we're hitting the uh, inversion weather where the sun shines itself every uh, couple of weeks. So it's already getting gloomy. As you guys know, I use my red light therapy a little more often during these times of the year. Of course, coupling that with some some bio blue to get the synergistic action uh, with the mitochondria and the photodynamic properties. But regardless, this week we're going to take a little slight detour from our usual look into photobiomodulation and and recently methylene blue. This still somewhat has to do with light in of itself, but kind of a more mind-expanding, thought-provoking topic. And as you can guess, (laughs) this is secondary to some interesting books or a series of books I've been reading recently that have really been like I said, expanding expanding my mind, blowing my mind, and really it's tough for me to wrap my mind around some of these constructs, which we'll, we'll be getting to here shortly, uh, because we've been raised for hundreds of years, thousands of years, that time and space are this real thing when in fact they are an illusion, there's actually no external world out there like that your eyes are looking at or perceiving. It's literally all inside of our head. It's our consciousness that is perceiving this energy going into our eyes. And I know that sounds really crazy, but the series of books I've been reading, which are entitled Biocentrism, they really debunk these so-called constructs of time and space. And so the books take a deep dive into the science and the physics and the biology and the um, astrology and cosmic aspects of time and space. And we're talking about going back into the BC era, Galileo, Einstein, and, and all of these scientists and philosophers and so forth that really thought about this kind of stuff and tried to understand it. And especially in this day and age where everyone's on a schedule and everyone's you know, looking at the clock and wondering, you know, what's next or what's going on tomorrow or thinking about their their quote unquote past. But have any of you guys really thought about what time is? What if there's no such thing as time? What if there's no such thing as space? And again, I know that sounds preposterous to a lot of people and it does to me and it's even still tough for me to wrap my mind around. But reading these books, again, they really do disprove time. Time is an illusion, and I know that sounds cliche, but it's actually true. Time is an illusion. Space is an illusion. The only thing that you are seeing with your eyes is because of your consciousness. If you're not looking at or perceiving it, then it's not actually quote-unquote there. So if you're familiar with the double-slit experiment, the photons that are going through the two slits, they can either be a particle or they can be a wavelength depending on if there's an observer or not. Not to get into the weeds, but if there's a consciousness observing the light, then the particle becomes a wave. So just like uh, in that sense, all of the electrons, all of these photons that are around us, they are just probabilities, so to speak, until they are observed by a consciousness. So it almost goes back to this concept of if a tree falls in the forest, and no one's there to hear it, does it actually make a sound? And in these books, they actually prove that no, it does not. Because sound is just another frequency that is picked up by sensory organs from something that has a consciousness. So I'm not going to keep going down this rabbit hole here, because I'm not going to be nearly as articulate as these books. But I'm just going to read a couple of chapters from the second book, There's three books, one that came out in, I think, 2009, one that came out in 2016, and then one that came out in, I believe it was 2020 or 2021, and I'm most of the way through the second book, and I want to read a couple of chapters in that book because I think that's a nice little snippet of of what I'm trying to 
extrapolate here. I'm probably doing a poor job, but before we dive into those couple of chapters, I'm just going to read to you the principles that were outlined in the first book. So you have a nice little background, so to speak, as, as we head into the second book in those couple of chapters. This is kind of comes from the FAQ in the back of the first book, but throughout the book, they basically, every chapter outlines a different principle of biocentrism. And so here's biocentrism's take on the cosmos. So there is no separate physical universe outside of life and consciousness. Nothing is real that is not perceived. There was never a time when an external, dumb, physical universe existed or that life sprang randomly from it at a later date. And so just to back step for a second, they dispel the entire notion of the Big Bang Theory, that this these random events happen and that everything in life is just this billiard ball reaction that's already kind of planned out. So that's what he means by a dumb physical universe is that like there's no spontaneity. It's all calculated. It's already doomed to happen, so to speak. So that's what he means by a dumb physical universe in that life sprang randomly from an at a later date. So space and time exist only as constructs of the mind, as tools of perception. Experiments in which the observer influences the outcome are easily explainable by the interrelatedness of consciousness and the physical universe. Neither nature nor mind is unreal. Both are correlative. No position is taken regarding God. So consider again the seven principles we have established. The first principle of biocentrism. What we perceive as reality is a process that involves our consciousness. An external reality, if it existed, would, by definition, have to exist in space. But this is meaningless because space and time are not absolute realities, but rather tools of the human and animal mind. Second principle of biocentrism. Our external and internal perceptions are inextricably intertwined. They are different sides of the same coin and cannot be divorced from one another. Third principle of biocentrism. The behavior of subatomic particles, indeed all particles and objects, are inexplicably linked to the presence of an observer. Without the presence of a conscious observer, they at best exist in an undetermined state of probability waves. Well guys, BioLite has what's called bundles. So simply go to the BioLite website, BioLite.shop, go under products and there will be a tab for bundles. With each of these bundles, there's three of them, you save 20% off on the entire package. For example, we have the Beauty Bundle, which includes a Shine and Stand, a Guardian Plus, and the Longev Revive Cream. So that bundle of three products, you save 20% off the entire package. There's the Recovery Bundle, that includes the Recharge Plus Panel, the Guardian Mouthpiece, and then the Longev Recover Cream. And that Recover Cream is just like the Revive Cream, except it has added CBD oil infused into it. That package of three items all comes at 20% off. And then the last bundle, which is the most versatile bundle in the sense that you get to pick and choose what products you want, you get to pick and choose from the Recharge Plus Panel, the Restore Plus Panel, or the Matrix Full Body Mat. And then you get to choose between the Guardian and Guardian Plus, and then you get to choose between the Revive and and the Recover Cream. It also includes the Shine and Stand, so you get to choose between black and silver. By purchasing those four products in the Ultimate Bundle, you save 20% off all of the products. You also save 20% off shipping. So literally, the entire package and shipping is 20% off. So if you're ever needing some red light therapy products and are looking for a discount, just remember, the bundles are always 20% off. 365 days a year, no coupon code necessary. Fourth principle of biocentrism. Without consciousness, matter dwells in an undetermined state of probability. Any universe that could have preceded consciousness only existed in a probability state. Fifth principle of biocentrism. The structure of the universe is explainable only through biocentrism. The universe is fine-tuned for life which makes perfect sense as life creates the universe, not the other way around. The universe is simply the complete spatio-temporal logic of the self. Sixth principle of biocentrism. Time does not have a real existence outside of animal sense perception. It is the process by which we perceive changes in the universe. And then the seventh and final principle of biocentrism. Space, like time, 
is not an object or a thing. Space is another form of our animal understanding and does not have an independent reality. We carry space and time around with us like turtles with shells. Thus, there is no absolute self-existing matrix in which physical events occur independent of life. And so, with those seven principles in mind, let's dig into uh, what is the 11th chapter in the second book, which is entitled Beyond Biocentrism, Rethinking Time, Space, Consciousness, and the Illusion of Death. And the authors are, I should have said this at the beginning, uh, Robert Lanza, who is a medical doctor, and and Bob Berman. And so, uh, both of them are rigored in, in science. Robert Lanza is one of the most respected scientists in the world, and Bob Berman is a longtime science editor of the Old Farmer's Almanac and contributing editor of Astronomy Magazine. So with all of that being said, let's jump into chapter 12, which is entitled, Where is the Universe Located? For some animals, the sense of touch or smell is paramount. For others, hearing is critical. Just watch rovers' ears as they swivel around. But humans rely on vision. In our explorations of the celestial realm beyond our planet, we have nothing else. We cannot hold the universe, nor can we smell it. Space is utterly quiet, so that the collision between small asteroids and the tumultuous births of galaxies unfold in silence. For us, knowledge of the cosmos arrives solely on the wings of photons. We have known for a century that light is composed of waves of magnetism along with electrical undulations traveling at right angles to it. Neither magnetism nor electricity have inherent color or brightness, and thus, even if there were an independent universe beyond consciousness, it would have to be utterly uninvisible. This bears repeating. At best, any separate external universe must be blank or black. Yet, look around. We're embedded in a world of profound color and beauty. People assumed, until the advent of quantum mechanics a century ago, that our eyes' lenses were like clear glass windows that let us accurately perceive what is out there, and this remains the general public view even today. However, since we know beyond any doubt that what's out there can be no more than invisible magnetic and electrical fields, It's obvious that we ourselves, our neurocircuitry, create the colors and patterns. The biological mechanisms responsible for vision were researched for centuries, with many wrong turns alternating with Eureka-like triumphs. Early philosophers rejected any notions that color and light were involved with an external world. Rather, wrote Plato in the 4th century BCE, light originates from within the eye, seizing objects with its own rays. But 600 years later, the famed physician Galen disagreed, saying that vision is a function of an optical pneuma, meaning it flows from the brain to the eyes through hollow optic nerves. This idea of the brain being central to sight put Galen's perception 15 centuries ahead of anyone else's. Today, every physiology text paints a clear explanation for what we see, quote-unquote, in front of us. First, light enters the quarter-inch wide lens of each eye where an upside-down image is focused upon the two retinas. There, at least in bright light, since dim light vision employs different machinery, six million cone-shaped cells, which come in three varieties, each sensitive primarily to light's primary colors of blue, red, or green, are stimulated only when they receive the impact of a specific range of energy wavelengths. Upon stimulation, they send electrical signals up heavy-duty cables to an astounding universe of neurons designed to create three-dimensional images. Most of this visual architecture lies at the back of the head, in the occipital lobe. There, over 10 billion cells and 1 trillion synapses create the world we experience. It is here alone, physiology texts state, that visual reality occurs. This is where brightness and color are created and perceived. So far so good, until one notices, perhaps idly, that we have just described three different visual worlds. There is the external world, the one in front of us, 
the realm that we presumably confront or look at. Then, there are the upside-down visual images in the retina, formed by those 6 million cone cells. And finally, there is the third visual kingdom in the brain or mind, where the images are actually constructed and perceived. Three visual realms, and yet only one appears to us. We don't see double, let alone triple. So which one is that? When we now look across our room to a window 15 feet away, we're entitled to ask, where is it located? Where is the universe? Language and custom say that it is outside us, that it is quote-unquote out there. But a smattering of scientists know that this cannot be so, that, in fact, everything occurs strictly within our heads. The point is ultimately as inarguable as gravity, but its full apprehension requires open-mindedness and scrupulous logic because it contradicts a lifetime of language and custom. So first, let's really be clear about where the visual experience occurs since this seemingly inconsequential issue has enormous implication. Answer, it's fashioned by those one trillion synapses in the brain. This is a stupendous amount of biological architecture. If you merely try to tally each of those neural connections devoted to vision at the rate of one per second, not to examine them but merely count them, it would require 30,000 years. This huge amount of physiological structure expends vast energy. And nature, we all know or suspect, does nothing for no reason. So let us not sell it short. The visual realm is perceived in this place alone. There are not multiple visual worlds. There is only one visual kingdom, and you perceive it clearly. It is occurring within your skull. That framed art hanging over there, across the room, is actually inside your head. Sure, you always imagined the brain's interior to be dark and mushy, despite reading that complex electric signals and lively energies course there. But now you know what the brain's interior is like. It is there, that framed art, and the window next to it, and the blue sky, all inside the mind. Indeed, even your brain and body are representations in your mind. But, you may protest, aren't there two worlds? The external, real world, and then another separate visual world inside your head? No, there is only one. Where the visual image is perceived is where it actually is. There is nothing outside of perception. How could there be? Quote, People are so sure they'll look out at the world, says Canadian physicist Roy Bishop, a senior editor of the Handbook of the Royal Astronomical Society, never ceasing to be amazed that most folks do not see the obvious. But the illusion of an external world comes from language. Everyone you meet participates in the same charade. It's not malevolent, but useful, as when we say, please pass the salt over there. What purpose would it serve to ask for the salt shaker inside your head? It is customary to allude to the world as existing outside of us. All right, you may say, a bit hesitantly now, but if that window is still within my skull, what about my fingertips that I'm holding up? Don't they define the outer limits of my body? No. They do not. Those fingers are also within your mind. They are the mind's representation, in tactile form when you experience touch and visually when you glance at your nails and consider trimming or biting them, and they too dwell within the mind. They are a representation of your body that exists itself within the mind. The window across the room and the framed art on the wall are no farther away than your fingers. They are equally within the mind. Of course, we usually define distance as the seeming gap between our mind bodies and, say, that mind tree. Our mind legs require effort and a long interval be before we reach the tree that's equally within the mind. So we call that a gap or space or distance, and that's fine. It's how we all express things as how the mind's body portrayal relates to other objects in the mind. And, granted, it can take a while to get accustomed to thinking of that stroll as occurring strictly from one part of your mind to another. And that at no point is your mind's representation of your body ever separate from anything else you observe in the world. 
Yet all this is true. Colors are created by us. The entire visual universe is located here, not out there. There, there is no such thing as out there. Now, if that is within myself, then in a very concrete sense, everything I see is me. I do not end, not even at the moon and beyond, at least visually and orally, like the ears, and perceptually. But can I at least establish a boundary between self and other in terms of control? Obviously, I can clap my hands, but I can't wiggle your toes. There seems some kind of real, practical demarcation. Alas, here too, with the control business, we get into a can of worms. Most people assume they can control stuff, even if their decisions pop up spontaneously. We do not know how we make a decision, it just somehow occurs. We don't know how to make our hearts beat or to perform the liver's 500 functions. We don't even know how to snap our fingers to music because, if we thought about it, too many muscle and nerve move movements are involved and we don't really know how to command them. We just do it. And despite most people, but not Albert Einstein, insisting that they have free will to control their bodies, minds, and lives, much experimental evidence since 1998 shows that this too may be an illusion. We're not going to go there and explore the seeming dichotomy long debated by scientists and philosophers alike, whether our lives operate via the mechanism of free will or determinism, or unfold spontaneously, or maybe even by some fourth process we have yet to articulate. What's central here is that the entire house of cards separation between me and other and body interior and exterior and nature versus ourselves are relative concepts involving yet more neural connections that impart assumptions about reality. We need to get past them all. We need to see what's baseline, bottom line real, in our quest for grasping the nature of the cosmos. Doing so, the accurate perception of everything visual as occurring in our mind is perhaps the easiest starting point. That this usually draws blank stares is a function of years of assuming otherwise. Early in 2015, we asked Dr. Bishop if he could suggest ways to help people get it. Here are two. First, light travels from the so-called external world to our eyes. Most people having at least a smattering of science knowledge would surely agree with that. Yet, most people believe that they look out at the external world. Does not the contradiction of these two ideas suggest that one of them is wrong? Unfortunately, our language reinforces the wrong idea. We say, look in the cupboard, look across the street, look at the moon, look through the telescope. Despite acknowledging the direction that light travels, nearly everyone thinks that they look at things, that their visual worlds coincides spatially with an external realm. Second, that color does not exist external to the observer is more difficult to appreciate because various color phenomena can be satisfactor uh, satisfactorily explained based upon the four types of light-activated cells in the retina. Three cone cells sensitive to red, green, and blue in bright light, and a single type of rod-shaped cell that responds in dim light. The absence of color in a scene lit by a quarter moon, color blindness, Contrast phenomena that can generate rich color sensations and the like can all be accounted for while assuming that retinal cones are color receptors as if color were part of the external world. Not until a person gets it that he does not look out, that his visual world is a private sensation deep within his brain, that each and every visual scene he experiences resides there, is it possible for that person to grasp that those indescribable hues are generated there too? There are obvious evolutionary advantages in having visual spectrum discrimination, and our brains evolved a simple way of providing such discrimination, with hue sensations. It is not necessary to negate the external world. We needn't say that it doesn't exist. It is enough to see through the false assumptions that we look at an external world while simultaneously, and equally erroneously, believing that a separate visual world lurks somewhere inside our skull despite it being seemingly imperceptible. What's important is to grasp that a two-world assumption is illusory, 
that the world we see is the visual perception located in our head. Language aside, there is no actual me performing an act of looking out. The me is a figure of speech corresponding to nothing at all, as vacuous as the word being in the phrase being empty. Rather, everything we see is the mind. The silverware on the table might be thought of as being situated in front of us, but its actual location is inside our heads. Indeed, with a little genetic engineering, you could probably make everything that's red move, or make a noise instead, or even make you feel hungry. Apprehending the cosmos as a single deathless entity synonymous with consciousness may require multiple logical steps, or it can be realized in a single eureka moment. Like those optical illusions where a set of stairs seems headed downward until suddenly everything changes and it's perceived entirely differently, this reality may have a similarly abrupt onset, a marvelous experience indeed. This is why so much time is now invested in this vision business. How many in the world see this? When asked this very question, Dr. Bishop produced with a wonderful reply. Have I personally met anyone who gets it? I have a friend I have known most of my life. We have discussed many things over the years, including vision. He gets it, as demonstrated in the following text that he wrote a couple of years ago as the caption to a photo of an autumn scene for a calendar produced by a local natural history society. Quote, This autumn scene presents a feast of color typical of the season. Light rays reflect from the leaves and are processed by the brain which forms an image within the darkness of the skull. By some feat of mental projection, we have the overpowering impression that the image we experience is located out there beyond our noses. It's a wonderful illusion. End quote. And then getting back to Dr. Bishop, this isn't rocket science. No math is involved and minimal science. But what is involved in getting it is a complete break with how one thought vision worked ever since early childhood. Vision operates so flawlessly, so easily, so marvelously, with no effort whatsoever on the part of its owner, that it takes a major leap of insight and introspection to make the transition from the naive assumption that one's visual world coincides spatially with the external world, to the realization that the brightness, detail, colors, and three-dimensionality can only reside somewhere within the absolute darkness of one's skull. That is a big mental leap, which for most people seems impossibly difficult to make. It is so easy to be misled by popular misconceptions. Even among scientists, most of whom who have never thought much about vision, my guess is fewer than 10% get it, possibly far fewer. The percentage is surely larger amongst perceptual psychologists and physiologists. In my own case, I had a PhD in physics before I appreciated where my visual world resided, before I realized that colors and brightness are sensations served up by my brain. That revelation hit me in the autumn of 1969 while reading a small book entitled The Rays Are Not Colored in 1967 uh, by W.D. Wright. Wright took the words for his title from Newton's classic book, Optics of 1704. Newton was one of the first to get it. The fact that I bought Wright's book and read it indicates that finally, at age 30, I was ripe for making that leap of insight. All this is but one of the magical aspects of the world, an aspect that helps make this sort of life so interesting, end quote. We only ask the reader to let this vision business sink in, to percolate. Quote, the only things we can ever perceive, said George Berkeley, for whom the campus and city were named, are our perceptions, end quote. There is no universe without perception. Consciousness and the cosmos are correlative. They are one and the same. So that's the end of that chapter. Now I just want to quickly jump around here in the last couple of minutes and just go over some of the other aspects of this book that I've highlighted or bracketed, um, which, which to me means it's like very important or profound information. And so I'm going to kind of just jump around here. It's not going to be necessarily a straight page or, or even a chapter, of course. But here's a little section where 
the authors were talking about depth perception and how how that plays a role with our quote unquote vision. So they go on to say that our takeaway is this. The magical sensation of depth must arise internally when the visual input with its parallax discrepancies is sorted out and presented to the conscious level of the brain. It follows that the rest of one's perceived visual world must be located there too, not out there beyond our body somewhere. It bears repeating, there is nothing quote-unquote out there beyond the reality constructed in our minds. Or if so, it would be utterly mysterious and unexperienced. Certainly not the world with its scurrying cars and trees swaying in the wind. All we know and can know is contained within our mind and the information processed in our brains. If this seems impossible to accept, remember that if there were to be some precursor to the colors, brightness, and 3D depth of the visual world we continually enjoy, some exterior stimulus, it would be no more than invisibly blank magnetic and electrical fields, since that's what light really is. Apprehending reality is an ongoing, goal-less informational process. By attempting to logically conceive of it is a different project, a piecemeal enterprise. Certainly, no single mental image can adequately capture being. A punchline or a single phrase that might fully express ultimate knowledge will remain elusive. But a good start is simply to see conscious experience as a swirl of information, while abandoning the notion that anything is truly external. Going back to the first book, here's another interesting quote. So when quantum theory implies that consciousness must exist, it tacitly shows that the content of the mind is the ultimate reality, and that only an act of observation can confer shape and form to reality, from a dandelion in a meadow to sun, wind, and rain. And then here's a paragraph uh, kind of speaking on the perception of time. So, the persistent human perception of time almost certainly stems from the chronic act of thinking, the one-word-at-a-time thought process by which ideas and events are visualized and anticipated. In rare moments of clarity and mental emptiness, or when danger or novel experience forces a one-pointed focus upon one's consciousness, time vanishes, replaced by an ineffably enjoyable feeling of freedom, or the singular focus of escaping an immediate peril. Time is never cognized normally in such thoughtless experiences, such as, quote, I saw the whole accident unfolding in slow motion, end quote. In sum, from a biocentric point of view, time does not exist in the universe independent of life that notices it, and really doesn't truly exist within the context of life either. And then let's quickly move along to some thoughts on space. So biocentrism, of course, shows that space is a projection from inside our minds, where experience begins. It is a tool of life, the form of outer sense that allows an organism to coordinate sensory information and to make judgments regarding the quality and intensity of what is being perceived. Space is not a physical phenomenon per se, and should not be studied in the same way as chemicals and moving particles. We animal organisms use this form of perception to organize our sensations into outer experience. In biological terms, the interpretation of sensory input in the brain depends on the neural pathway it takes from the body. For instance, all information arriving on the optic nerve is interpreted as light, whereas the localization of a sensation to a particular part of the body depends on the particular pathway it takes to the central nervous system. Okay, and then let's wrap up with a couple other little snippets here. These are several paragraph snippets, but I think this will kind of be a good closing point uh, for biocentrism. So because your head may be now spinning, let's take a break and go back to my friend Barbara, sitting comfortably in her living room with her glass of water, certain of its existence and her own. Her house is as it has always been, with its artwork on the wall, the cast iron stove, the old oak table. She putters between rooms. Nine decades of choices. Dishes, bedsheets, art, machines and tools in the workshop, her career, define her life. Every morning, she opens her front door to bring in the Boston Globe or to work in her garden. She opens her back porch door to a lawn dotted with whirligigs, squeaking as they go around and round in the breeze. 
She thinks the world churns along whether she happens to open the door or not. It does not affect her in the least that the kitchen disappears when she's in the bathroom, that the garden and whirligigs evaporate when she's sleeping, that the shop and all its tools don't exist while she's at the grocery store. When Barbara turns from, from one room to the next, when her animal senses no longer perceive the kitchen, the sounds of a dishwasher, the ticking clock, the groaning pipes, the smell of a chicken roasting, the kitchen and all its seemingly discrete bits dissolve into the primal energy nothingness or waves of probability. The universe bursts into existence from life, not the other way around. Or, perhaps more graspably, there dwells an eternal correlativity of nature and consciousness. And then we'll move along to this last little bit here. To grasp a universe of still arrows and disappearing moons more fully, let's turn to modern electronics and our animal sense perception tools. You know from experience that something in the black box of a DVD player turns an inanimate disc into a movie. The electronics in your DVD player convert and animate the information on the disc in a two-dimensional show. Likewise, your brain animates the universe. You can imagine the brain as being like the electronics in your DVD player. Explained another way, in the language of biology, the brain turns electrochemical impulses from our five senses into an order, a sequence, into a face, into this page, into a room, into an environment, into a unified three-dimensional whole. It transforms a stream of sensory input into something so real that few people ever ask how it happens. Our minds are so good at creating a three-dimensional universe that we rarely question whether the universe is anything other than we imagine it. Our brains sort, order, and interpret the sensations we receive. Photons of light, for example, which arrive from the sun carrying electromagnetic force, by themselves look like nothing. They are bits of energy. As uncounted trillions bounce off the objects around us, and some are reflected our way, Various combinations of wavelengths enter our eye from each and every object. Here, they deliver the force of trillions of atoms arranged into an exquisite design of several million cone-shaped cells that rapidly fire in permutations too fast for any computer to calculate. Then, in the brain, the world appears. Light, which as we saw in chapter 3, has no color by itself, is now a magical potpourri of shapes and hues. Further parallel processing, snaking through neural networks at one-third of the speed of sound, makes sense of it all. A necessary step because those who were blind for decades but whose sight was restored gazed confusedly and unsurely at the world, unable to see what we see or to process the newfound input usefully. Sights, tactile experiences, odors, all these sensations are experienced inside the mind alone. None are out there except by the convention of language. Everything we observe is the direct interaction of energy and mind. Anything that we do not observe directly exists only as potential, or, more mathematically speaking, as a haze of probability. Nothing, said Wheeler, exists until it is observed. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen we will end our tour of biocentrism. I know this was <laughs> kind of seemingly random, but as you could kind of grasp or understand from, I guess, today's excerpt of biocentrism, it's just a very thought-provoking and apparently contradicting reality of how we perceive the world and, and essentially how we interact with energy and light, and thus how that light we perceive that light, whether it's through our eyes and vision, sound in our ears, taste in our tongues, tactile touch. Uh, these are all just different frequencies. And the world that we perceive out there, or the external world, is actually all inside of our heads. And so I'm still <laughs> I'm still trying to, to wrap my own mind around this and the implications of that. But as the book's alluded to, we've just been so indoctrinated into thinking, well, there's the external world that I'm interacting with, and then there's the internal world in my brain, and, and that running uh, a monkey, you know, the stream of consciousness that's yap, 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 constantly going. And so we, we have this duality of internal world versus external world, wherein biocentrism 
everything is consciousness or perceived in the brain. There is no out there that quote unquote out there is our consciousness and, and being perceived inside of our head. So again, I'm not going to just continue to repeat what the, what the books have kind of elucidated for us. But again, it's just another facet or another aspect of our interaction with light, our interaction with frequency, and just really how we experience life, how we experience and, and perceive this world we live in. So I, I just think it's very interesting, again, thought-provoking, and I hope you found it at least a little bit interesting. I mean, I didn't want to go too far off the beaten path of of red light therapy because I know that's the central thesis of uh, this podcast. But anytime I can have some sort of kind of offshoot, kind of thought-provoking diatribe on on a different take on light and frequency as it interacts with, you know, our cells and biology and, and, and life, you know, I think it's pretty good to bring that to the forefront and just at least expose you guys to that. And as I was reading uh, these couple of books the last couple of weeks, I thought it'd be pretty cool to share it with you guys. And if you're interested, you know, I highly recommend you check out his books or or kind of other concepts surrounding this biocentrism. Um, and if this was kind of like just too weird or, or uh, too far out there or kind of tough to comprehend, you know, I completely understand and <laughs> not to worry because we're not going to continue along this path, path much farther. I just wanted to bring it to your awareness. I guess that's a little punny. So you deal with it what you will. But again, I hope you found it at least slightly interesting or, or entertaining. With all that being said, not to worry, we'll we'll start start up on some interviews next week and we'll get the ball rolling there. We have some really great interviews planned for November, so you got that to look forward to. But as always, I always enjoy your feedback, so let me know your thoughts on this episode if you thought it was kind of too out there or you found it intriguing and insightful um, and otherwise. But as always, you guys have an amazing week living in your mind as, as biocentrism would uh, propagate enjoy living in your mind, enjoy living <laughs> and perceiving the, the world uh, inside your head. And as always, go go outside, soak up some of those photons from the sun um, as necessary. Enjoy those photons from your red light therapy devices um, as they irradiate your, your mitochondria that are inside your head, which, which, is, which is true. Your brain is the most mitochondrial dense tissue uh, in your body. So that's actually true on multiple fronts. But uh, regardless, I'll, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox here. You guys enjoy your week. I'll see you on next week's episode with, with a great interview we have. And as always, light up your health. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolight. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.